tēnā koutou katoa. I think this is supposed to be an informal chat. Is that right? That's right. Uh, specifically to try and open up some discussion and thinking around Yona's new work that has literally just opened, as Moira said, an arrangement for five rooms. Am I getting scratches from that mic? Okay. Um, but a little bit of background, Yona. A little bit of a bio on you, because you have been busy, not just now on this project, but for some time. Um, so Yona Lee lives in Auckland, New Zealand, and completed her MFA at Elam School of Fine Arts in 2010. She's had recent exhibitions in many public galleries in New Zealand and also some prominent international venues. So there's been an exhibition at the Dunedin Public Art Gallery, also the Art Gallery of New South Wales, where a solo project was there in their atrium space, their central atrium space. Uh, the City Gallery Wellington, which similarly installed a work in the sort of interstitial space where people meet and, and move. Uh, to Tuhi in Auckland and um, West Space in Melbourne. And then in relation to these biennial projects, which perhaps have a more temporal nature, she in 2020 uh, returned to her original hometown Busan to participate in the Busan Biennial and in 2019 had a work in the prestigious 15th Lyon Biennial in Lyon in France as well as the Changwon Sculpture Biennial in Seoul in 2016. The what Yona you've been calling for some time now the In Transit project actually began in Seoul in many ways, didn't it? Um, in 2016, where you were having a residency at Samji Space, at Loop Gallery. Um, in the interview that we've just done for Art Toy, um, because I was thinking about this project here and all the use of steel, I thought it was quite nice to start just by casting your mind back to the length of time you've been working with that material that you see here, steel, the stainless steel tube, and just think about the connotations of that material when you first worked on it, and whether you in fact thought, here's a material I was going to work on for ages, or mm. whether it just took shape there. Mm. Do you want to talk about that first? Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks Natasha, thanks Maura, thanks everyone for being here today. Um, so we're talking about the, um, the history of the material that I started working on. And it sort of goes back to 2016 when I um, did a residency in Seoul um, supported by Asia New Zealand Foundation at Nanji. And, um, and I think that time in particular in my career, I felt like I had to... I revisit my um, original um, country where I was born to rethink and reshape um, my work. And, um, and thinking through that process, I, I knew that when I'm there um, in residency, like three months in Seoul, and uh, I lived in Busan, but not in Seoul, so it was quite a even though it's, it's Korea, it's a very unfamiliar city for me. And I thought about the, the infrastructure um, in the residency that um, I, I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to like, make everything myself. So I had to sort of figure out a way of um, working on a new project that, that I can um, bring other fabricators and easy to communicate. And so I sort of like turned to more of the generic material. And at the time, um, uh, like the joints. So it was sort of easy, easier to 
like fabricate with other people. That was that was one thing in my mind when working on a project, and also I also started thinking about the contrast of living in different cities, um, different countries in New Zealand and Korea, and and I thought about the most um, the contrasting experience that I've had um, was due to that the density of population um, in contrast to the land mass. So in Korea, it's like small land, there's like big population, so like everything is so cluttered and so dense, and um, therefore the, um, the transportation, the infrastructure there is very different to like living in New Zealand. So I remember like when I first came to New Zealand, like people were talking about if you don't have a car, like it's really hard to live here. Um, but in like Seoul, like the subway, um, the infrastructure and the buses and everything is so like, um, like so um, done really well. You don't really need a car. So I thought about that, um, that way of like navigating space um, um, compared to here in, in Korea and thinking about the, um, the subway, the infrastructure and um, and looked at this handrail material, stainless, and and I started to realize that this material was basically like everywhere. Like at the time, I I took a bunch of photos for my research, and you know when I look through them, they're like the bus handles and like a bus pole and like the subway uh, train where the um, the they uh, support like the bags. Um, and like the handrails and like the uh, fences and even street lights and, and so on. So it's sort of like, and I sort of thinking about like this language of like handrail, like, you know, um, they're there to, you know, safety and like, um, and when you're like in a bus, it helps you to, you know, help you with your body position and so on. And, but at the same time, like there's like the barrier, um, barricade where it controls your movement, and we're so used to like being um, like queuing and and so on. And there's sort of like almost like contradicting um, the language of the use of the material that really intrigued me. And and I also like think about especially with COVID um, times where you know like it was always about the balance of safety and. Um, control, like how much um, control, like you know, like lockdowns and border control. How much do we, can we, um, like we feel quite uncomfortable, but we do understand that they are there for safety and health and safety. So there's something about this, um, I guess, conversation between these two contradicting um, elements that I'm quite interested in. Mm. We're too far from there. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. I mean, it's quite funny when you make a project like we have been making this work that's upstairs for I think a year at least and um, someone you always say something new about it <laughs> I've been extracting different messages for quite a while and I think the idea of safety and also control is an interesting one because right from the beginning as well into that system you put furnishings, items of domestic furnishings, didn't you? And they became a mo motif as much as the um, steel itself for this series, which has now reshaped itself in numerous different gallery and non-gallery settings. Um, I'm really interested then thinking again, still we're back in Seoul, about which kind of domestic items you chose to put into that system. Um, I think um, how things are made in Asia or Korea, like China, um, it's very efficient driven. And so you, you find all these products that are made based on that spirit. So it was so easy for me to kind of dismantle these objects from its system and incorporate part of my uh, structure. And um, so basically, I thought about different spaces and like, like private spaces, public spaces, and what other objects, like the, um, how they're made, can allow these um, different 
objects that come into the work. And I thought about um, these objects sort of like as a way of signifying different spaces and a way of like bringing different spaces together. And I thought about how like when we um, arrange spaces, for example, at home, like we like to divide the spaces with walls. Like we like to divide, like this is like a kitchen space where we cook and eat, um, like a bathroom, like a bedroom. So there's a tendency of like categorizing all these different spaces. And I was sort of like interested in kind of blurring that, um, that barrier, that walls. So, um, so I thought a lot about bringing like spaces like, um, like a bedroom or like a domestic setting through like a lampshade or like a lantern that may signify like a park or in like public space, like a bus handle um, from uh, like a bus, um, bus chair and bunk bed that could maybe reference like a backpacker setting, um, like uh, cafe tables that, that reference like cafe. So like I, I, um, I tried to bring in like all these different spaces together, like sort of like a space of like the internet where uh, like space and time kind of collapse and they flattens so much through that technology that we have around us and thinking a lot about like, um, like when I travel, you know, when I back in Seoul, like I was so dependent on this um, subway app where um, you just navigate through all these numbers and lines and, and you sort of enter this like train, uh, subway train station and they, they look really abstract and, and then you sort of like go in the train and you don't really feel like moving. So there's something about that sense of going into the abstract space and then coming out of like an mm. exit and, and suddenly somewhere in that sort of collapse of like time and space, um, like flattening experience that, that I was quite interested in. And I sort of realized that again when a friend of mine like suggested we just walk um, past a few different stops. And, and I realized that, you know, my understanding of that space dramatically changed when you actually walk through like A to B rather than traveling through like a car or like a train and thinking about how, and then sort of that my thoughts sort of kind of track back into how all these developments that we have as modernization of technology, it, um, how it sort of helped us a lot, but at the same time, on the other hand, all other different um, consequences that we face nowadays, including like how our relationship with space and time. So yeah, mm. you've talked about that before when we've spoken in the early days about in transit how um, these kinds of public spaces and including gallery spaces can also feel alienating for your body. And, um, and thinking about the furnishings, there's a suggestion of invitation to sit and rest. And I remember you spoke about visiting um, a museum after being jet lagged, which is quite a common experience, especially coming from New Zealand, Aotearoa and traveling. But as well, also, if you're an Asian traveling, there's that sort of 12-hour flight. So often you're arriving somewhere. And it's perhaps air travel has that similar disorientation of space and time. You spoke about arriving, I can't remember whether it was in Philadelphia or about that feeling of really needing a rest, but then sort of getting told off. And <laughs> um, when you describe that, there's a sense of trying to make these spaces feel a bit more homely mm. through their furnishing. Um, and you, the, the bunk beds have become a bit of a motif or certainly beds in, the, in transit work. Um, they look like you want to rest, but do, do you actually envisage people interacting with the work in that way? Yes, I do. I think um, it's uh, open, open for the how how um, the audience 
use this space and the work. And um, thinking back when I traveled to Philadelphia to, to see the work in museum, you know, like um, it's massive museum and there's so much to see. And um, as Natasha said, like coming from New Zealand, like 12 hour flight, uh, you know, they're very, the least, you know, there's mm. the short, um, um, the travel you, you take from here. And arriving there, um, so like, you know, like the time difference and just couldn't keep going in the afternoon and I was looking at the work and I, um, I just had to rest and, and I wanted to nap a little bit. <laughs> and I found this very unpopular room and I asked the guard whether I could like nap there for like 20 minutes explaining that I came from the opposite part of the world and, and he was very kind and said, you can nap. And so I took a nap there and, because um, I tried to nap in the more like public area, but it was really cold. It was like winter at the time. So I had to sort of go into this little exhibition room and, and, then, and then another guard came and she was like really, really angry for me um, napping there. And that made me realize how like, um, you know, museums, they often, there's so, it requires a lot of effort, like a lot of energy to look and so on. And um, so I thought about like, it'd be quite nice to have like a, a bed for people to nap and rest. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I was just um, thinking as well though uh, about napping in those spaces because you've removed all the barriers and the walls, you're quite exposed. So anybody resting is also going to be on display and performative in a way, yes. unless they have no awareness, unless they're young or mm. extremely tired. And is that part of your thinking as well? Yes, when I, um, when I thought about um, collaging different spaces together, um, when you think about these spaces, it's not just objects and it's not just about material, it's about the people interacting with these objects. And um, so the, the idea is that when people interact with the work, they're kind of performing, they're kind of like representing their space um, through the work, um, but it's not really spoken. Mm. Mm. When we launched uh, the new work on Friday night, we discussed actually activating it with a performance. Mm. And we'll come back to that in a minute, but um, I wanted to introduce the subject of music first or in and around performance because um, you've spoken, I think, publicly before about your background with music. But in this piece, it's highlighted much more overtly than in previous works. You have used music stands in the Tatuhi installation and you've given a musical title to a work, but this one is really composed, yes? And you called the work an arrangement in five rooms. Using that actual site, the specificity of the architecture of the Friedlander Galleries to pace the work through compositionally um, through moments of intensity and quiet and intensity again and forward momentum and then a sort of spectacular mm. throwing out to the exterior, quiet, as well as creating places for audience. Um, can you talk a little bit, as we've done before, but for the benefit of people here about that um, practice as a young person and learning an instrument, which can be really intensive, and how in a way you stepped away from it to study art and go to art school. Mm -hmm. And then the reason or the choice to come back to it in this much more specific way. So I, um, I started playing the instrument um, cello since I was like eight. And I got quite serious when I immigrated here when I was 12, 11. 
And I think one of the reasons was that, you know, I couldn't speak English at the time and it took a long time to be able to speak and um, understand uh, without too much of difficulty. And I think that kind of setting sort of like um, made me sort of focus in ways of um, kind of communicating in different ways. And I think music was um, something that kind of helped in that process because you don't have to speak and it's very universal language and, um, and it's kind of abstract. So, um, but, and so I sort of got into music, got into music school to audition everything, but my wrist was sort of hurting at the time. So like, um, and physically I wasn't, you know, it, it's very demanding on certain part of your body to, to, to play. And um, so I decided, oh, what are the other um, ways of um, working abstract ways without stressing certain parts, part of your body. And, um, and, then, and then I decided to go to art school. And I think in that training, what really intrigued me was how the practice of like trying to understand the composer's intention like as much as possible. And it goes into quite funny um, areas where you're reading about their romantic lives at the time they wrote the music and like the political situation, like what, where they come from and their like family history. You read about their parents' like jobs and it's, um, it's, really, it's really intense in that because I think there's something about that eager to sort of understand the composer's like intention and like, and so on. And, but there's also quite interesting about how like, so they're like a mask, there are a few pieces of like um, music written for, I say for cello, but they're like how many um, cellos that perform the same piece of music and people still find something interesting to hear it, and, I, and that's where the interpretation of um, individuals that they come into play. And so there's something about, I've been talking to my um, old cellist friend, and he sometimes talks about his teacher used to tell him, you need to own, you need to own the piece. And there's something about like this voice of the composer and the, um, the voice of the interpreter, they kind of coexist, and I was sort of kind of fascinated in that relationship and and um, and there's something about this you know this act of performance where every time you perform like there's always like subtle differences and there's always about um, a, a, a sense of improvisation where it's not about like changing notes or like rhythms but it's all about how you play that that moment of time with different um, like maybe different ways of breathing mm. or like tones and how you feel and you think about the space, at the audience, so everything sort of comes into play when you perform in that particular moment. So when I um, sort of when I started thinking more about in the art context, that idea of a work that's made in your studio and then goes into museum and then travels into different spaces, I found that quite very hard to understand the practice. I was quite confused, like, so is this work um, not really considering the people who's gonna see or the, the museum or the space they're exhibiting, the, the architecture and so on and so on. So I thought about that a lot, so, I, so for a long time I, worked on like one-off uh, site-specific work, which is um, what I've done for this new project. And um, so going, coming back to this space in particular, when Natasha um, showed me these spaces when we first started our conversation, I, I really tried to understand the flow of the space and what was quite special about these spaces were they were linear. There were like five rooms in a linear um, way and there were two um, entry points into the space and then there was a, a large room and a small room and three repeated rooms that have 
glass facade. And often these three um, spaces, um, they have like direct connection with the park, but often they have this built walls and blinds down. Uh, so you don't really see that um, the park and because of the how the museum have to protect the artwork and um, and they wanted more walls to hang um, the work and so for me it was um, to bringing that sort of um, musical way of like interpreting um, the composer intentions or um, how the space reads. I wanted to like um, work on this project that brings out all these special, unique features that the Friedlander spaces have, that the only these spaces have, um, um, and make them quite special and kind of bring these out through work. And um, so I tried to kind of like, and I thought of, I think because there were like five rooms, um, that sort of helped me to think more about the composition. I think about not only musically, but also thinking about how like a book or like a story might develop through different chapters. Like I was really interested in, like if you think about how song is structured, there's like intro, there's verse, there's um, second verse, there's like a bridge and there's, um, and so on, like, I was interested in like how a theme might develop and um, into something else and then comes back repeated in variations and there's introduction. So thinking about all these, how like a story or like a song or like in classical music, like a sonata or concerto might um, develop and take people through uh, journeys through the work and thought about like how what gestures might um, work best and, and maximize that um, the quality of the different these five spaces. Mm. I think there is something really beautiful about this work which adds to uh, the in transit series because you've you have stretched space out. Um, and uh, in addition, you've taken a, a trademark of the gallery, which is the handrail that's actually existing everywhere and a feature of the architects. Um, and it's made it feel like there's this atmosphere that the actual building is bending into the work. That was something we talked about really early on, how literally you wanted to take the handrail. Um, I don't know how many of you people know how Jana's works, but she's literally talking about <laughs> taking off the handrail and herself welding on a new piece of steel. Um, so it's challenging and your skills are at the point that you can replicate that really high finish. Um, so in the beginning, the work was developed digitally and... Um, and you had this concept of creating a composition, but uh, that's also brave because you're working intensively with, uh, the, in a way, the maths of the space. You took a lot of readings because no room is perfect. So because Jan is attaching things in such, so many points in three dimensions, she's taking multiple different measurements across the floor and the ceiling and the walls because once the steel is made off-site and brought on, there's no room for error, really. Um, and then creating this big wrapped steel piece which really just leaves the room open in Friedlander too, for example. And then in the second room, you create this kind of really tight, busy feeling again and more like the in-transit work with the steel and this feeling of almost like a little cubic house with a bar to charge your phone and cafe seats and nice plants and little Christmassy feeling lights and then bang, it goes out again and then you're just left with the um, rail. And I think for visitors, this is also a strange feeling because when you go into a gallery, you expect to be quite passive and told about the work, oh, now there's this, there's this, and when you go boom out into a room with just one bar, you really 
need quite a lot of confidence to be able to carry people through. And it was really interesting watching people navigate that space and whether they could cope or not. And I think just at the perfect moment when there's a feeling like it might just disappear off, you send the bar outside <laughs> into the park. Um, that was really important to you right from the beginning, going into the outside. And we, it had to be important because it was complex. So we knew we could have let it go because it certainly takes a, there's a lot involved in building a work outside, anywhere, and there's even more involved in building on a site like that, which is an historic site. Um, so, Yona, can you talk a little bit about that move outside and what that meant for you and why it was important for the work? I um, So, during, you know, you, you, you research all the time. Your mind's always in research mode, even when you're not working on a particular project. And um, I've looked at a lot of... Um, the relationship between a glass and a steel mm. uh, with handrails. And often these, um, the panes of glass were, uh, are used um, to support the uh, stainless handrails. And also I've looked at um, some of these LED slotted handrails in, in place for, for night. So all these, um, so these sort of uh, lang languages I, I've been looking at it for a while and um, and just was waiting for the right project to arrive to utilize that language. So it was always, I think I started looking at this, um, even the, the glass and the stainless relationship probably back in 2012. Mm. Um, and, and a few years looking at this LED slots and, but it, it had to, uh, uh, wait to be waited until the right uh, timing and right project arrive. And immediately when I saw this glass facade, I knew that that was the pinnacle of the um, the journey when you are through the walking through the space. I knew that that was the 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 the, the, um, the dynamic the, the most dramatical dramatic space um, out of five spaces. And so I wanted to um, kind of utilize that and also like there's something quite special about this connection with the outside the park and inside because we we talked about it earlier like when you go into museum like you're kind of uh, separated from um, the world and uh, you sort of are driven by all these um, endless corridors and rooms and they're so interconnected that um, you don't really, um, you lose a sense of like where you are in relation to the building and the outside, you lose that orientation. And in that freelander space is where you suddenly gain that perspective, like where you are in relation to the park and Kitchener Street and Wellis Street Street. And, um, so, and so it was quite important to um, kind of highlight the space in some gestures and, um, and also, I was thinking a lot about the inside and outside, uh, particular during this uh, COVID uh, time, where um, you know we're further like um, building walls. Uh, there's acrylic walls between people at counters, and we're wearing masks, and we're there constant barriers and disconnections and. Um, um, the control and and I thought about um, that a lot and it was quite important to kind of um, have a gesture that kind of carry a sense of freedom and I thought that was very important um, in this time in particular and um, and also coming back into the gallery space and so that that is um, I was thinking of that gesture as the highlight of the the project and we worked not just me but Natasha and the team, Alice Tyler, who worked for how many months to get um, mm. consent approval from council and we we had like arborists, we had to get like letters from arborists, um, 
engineers and... TV reports. Yeah, mm. so many different people. There are five different groups of people looking at that. Um, ten specialists. Ten specialists. So I think so I, I think I learned so much in that process. I think before then, I, I think I was just thinking more about just my ideas, my work, but then when it actually went in to outside, there's a whole lot of complications and mm. bureaucracies and like you have to navigate and um, so then you realise again it's not just your work, it's, you know, there's so many different people um, help to make that project um, possible, including the securities and they've been quite generous about that project as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite beautiful too because actually it's a relatively small part of the overall work. So it's a disproportionate amount of work in some <laughs> ways to achieve that small piece. But it is beautiful having, as you say, the LED fitting because it adds something quite different. I don't know if you've all seen it yet, but like you have the two knots at either end of the work, the LED um, doubles its reflection in the mirror, so spatially it widens the work out uh, laterally, which is a really beautiful touch to the piece, as well as providing a nice place to have a cup of tea. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk, Yona, a little bit about, again, this idea of um, the title mm -hmm. in transit that you used. And especially beautiful, I think, was a piece of writing. I can't remember. Maybe it was by the curator who worked with you at Loop, was it? Yes. Yeah, and she wrote again about the piece in Busan. Mm. So that was reflecting back on the original, but also on this new work for Busan. And based in um, Korea, she was thinking about specifically wanting to tackle what do these forms say about home? Mm. And what do they say about diasporic subjects and the relationship to a fixed home? I think it was a, a really beautifully written text, and um, it struck it did strike me that there is something um, quite apart from the things that we're quite used to hearing about art and its interactivity. There's something more that you're wanting to do here, mm. and in around the subject of creating a new nuance for mm. migratory uh, subjects and the idea of home being something that is both flexible and uh, rooted mm. it's okay, and, and, and okay. It, ha it has these, as you say, kind of like um, off-the-rack mm. um, furnishings and yet uh, a feeling of connectedness is there. Mm. We ended our interview talking a little bit about that, but do you want to talk about how you see mm. yourself, what your view is and around that idea of transitory mm. um, home? And I think that was Chonga Chonga Lee. She was, yeah. was the curator at Loop, and she wrote a piece um, at for Contemporary Hum, oh, that's right, yeah. um, for the piece I'd made for Busan. And, um, and I think a lot about like this temporal nature of these structures that I'm creating, and and it was when like I didn't really think of it as a livable structure when I first um, worked on it for a large scale for Loop Gallery in Seoul, and um, and I had like you know I had very limited support at the time, and so I had like one welder and myself installing that scale of work for five days. So it just makes no sense when you think about it now because, um, so like, he, he worked really efficiently, he made it happen, but at the same time, like, I, I had to stay there, like, till late night and, and, and ended up not having time to be able to go back to my residency to sleep. So I had, like, a bed, not bunk bed, just one single bed installed there more like, um, I, I thought it more like, um, like um, what are the furnitures you use for, like stages, like um, a set, like a set, mm. uh, rather than a functional object, because I even had like a bar across uh, the bed, suggesting that 
um, no one's allowed to sleep there. And, and I looked at around and looked around and I saw a bed I installed there um, and I had to sleep there overnight for a couple of days. Um, and that space was like very industrial, like it was concrete, a ceiling wall floor and, not floor, ceiling wall and no windows, it was underground. Mm -hmm. And it was like at winter, um, close to winter and um, and when I slept there, I realized that how cozy, how cozy the experience was. And I was quite um, surprised of how comfortable um, sleeping in that structure was. And then I realized that I was making like a livable structure. And I was thinking if I only had like a shower. I think someone actually mentioned at the opening, like, he said, he was in Freeland, the two gallery space, and he said, oh, if there was a shower, I could, like, live here. And so that was when I sort of started thinking about, I'm actually li making liberal structures. And, and when I showed in Lyon, like, these French people were calling my work, this is like a kiwi nest, we'll take care of this when you leave. And so that sent the idea of, like, creating a nest, like a temporary home. And I think that kind of goes back to... I think, um, an experience of living as a migrant, um, like relocating um, your home and your idea of home of, as a like, permanent uh, place. Um, you lose that sense of meaning. And when you actually construct a new home, a new land, you, you sort of like start to dis, um, deconstruct what comprises of a home, what you need mm. to live. And it's, it's kind of similar experience when you actually travel, like you pack everything into a bag and then you start to identify the essentials that you need um, to keep going. And, um, and I think that idea or the experience definitely feeds back to when thinking about in transit, when moving through spaces, different countries and navigating different infrastructures and ways of living. Mm. Mm. It's, it's additionally quite resonant in that case that you supply music for your essential, mm. essential ingredients of home. Um, we also talked about the resonance of this pipe. Um, and um, being a new quality to the work, uh, I wonder, did you think it was successful on Friday? I'm just going to ask you now in front of everyone. So what, what we did, we, it was a bit of an experiment, but we asked a chalice to break a work up into five parts and play through the work. Originally, our idea was that he would sort of sit on the work, but he wasn't so keen on that, was he? But um, it was... It's quite early days to mm -hmm. unpack it, but it really changed the work, didn't it? Having him, he played a contemporary piece for music fans. He played a Hindemith cello sonata, Opus 25. Yes. Wasn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. number three. Um, how did you feel about it? I, I thought that was a really interesting experience because, um, you know, I think about this experience going to a concert and they lock the door and you can't really leave for like, two hours and um, it's very, um, you know, it's very uh, controlled environment and if you actually leave, it's very inappropriate and people look at you very uncultured and uneducated and, um, but there's something about seeing people in museums, they just, some people, you know, just walk like straight past a painting, like hardly spend a minute mm. and there's something about that um, that I find it quite interesting mm. and I think when Vincent played the piece there's something quite nice about slowing people down mm. to uh, appreciate the work you know he played like uh, a piece and then moved to the second space and then people followed him and then we um, sat there until um, he finished playing and then we moved to another space. There's something about him taking 
the people through mm. the space in a more controlled manner, I think. It was mm. a bit Pied Piperish, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, no, it was beautiful, particularly um, in the dense room in Friedlander too. He, we positioned the chair right in the middle and it was in the third movement of the piece, which has a bit more mm. intensity to it also. It was, was quite powerful, but also he did, he looked suddenly, there was this literal interpretation of the work where it looked like he was in his bedroom practicing. Did you feel that? There was something quite <laughs> strange about that and almost autobiographical coming back to your, I remember when we talked about your coming to New Zealand and that sort of non-language space, you described it almost like being in a bubble um, through high school and when I saw Vincent in his room, I had this really clear feeling of him similarly creating a bubble with this music, which was really, really beautiful. Um, I'm not sure what else there is to say, and I feel like we've canvassed a lot, and there's more. We, I, I wanted to talk about the... Cons we haven't talked about making of the work. Were well, you going to ask me a well, question? Before <laughs> we move on, like, we'll have more public programme with the cellist oh, performing. Yes. Later, so yeah, yeah which will be very on. special. Mm. Yeah, in fact, I think we should do it more than once. We'll see how more it goes, but yeah. it actually is a this quite stunning activation of the work and a bit of a trial on opening night, but <laughs> uh, choreographed well, it, it will be fantastic. Um, I don't know if everybody knows that you also make the work yourself. I know that also. Um, in other words, all the bending and welding you do off-site yourself and have not got a welding certificate by apprenticeship but have taught yourself more or less on a needs basis. Mm. So for this work, which matches the gallery's highly brushed finish, there's an extra level of process involved. And it's extraordinary to think of you developing all of the material and bringing it in on, I don't know how many truckloads we ended up with. Um, when we spoke earlier too about artistic influences, I know that you bring to bear on the work an interest in sculptural minimalism. So thinking back to artists from, in particular, the 60s in Europe and Northern America, artists who were exploring industrial materials and particularly kind of modularity. In other words, the way in which steel could be used in multiple different settings or a pre-cast, pre-made form. Um, and you mentioned your interest in artists like Charlotte Posnenska, for those who are interested in that reference. But what I was thinking about when the work was coming into shape actually was as well as that, and the motifs mm. from the 60s of industry and the sort of hardness or the mm. uh, absence of human hand that was, in fact, desirable and part of the awe to those works, There's a, you're bringing back that homeliness quality. It really softens mm. the relationship to steel, but equally it makes... Um, it draws you in to an experience where you're quite intimate with the beauty of metal. Um, you have just been through this enormous, incredible process of months and months and months of making through Christmas, through lockdown, creating these incredible friendships with industry so that you could build in the workshop during level three. <laughs> um, how do you feel about that relationship with the steel now? And, Mm. And will you continue with it? I think um, I love the, the language from the 60s, like the minimalism and so on, but I do find them quite problematic, how they're very male-dominated. And if you look at some of these um, work made by these um, males, they're very masculine. There's no emotions, there's no a softness in it. It's very about holding space. And, um, and for me, and I'm also quite interested in these, you know, those furnitures from the Bauhaus 
period. And they're also very male-dominated. And I think when I see this material, I find they're very, you know, they're very cold, they're, they're very industrial. And very, uh, if you go to like metals, come, uh, uh, fabricators, you know, they're like loud, they're like very um, dirty and they're um, cranes. And, um, and even now, like some of these um, companies have these calendars of like um, girls and... Early calendars. Yes. They still have them around. I don't know why. <laughs> and um, so I find this material like really, really um, cold. And, and for me, um, bringing these objects and um, as, you, as Natasha said, it softens and, and makes it um, quite invitational. And also like these tubular lines in space, for me, they, I believe that they come from like my understanding of like sound, how they um, vibrate in space and how they, um, and how they sort of like work with space. So I think, you know, when you think about music, it's all about emotions. It's all about um, like dynamics of like being sad, being happy and all these, um, not new, you know, endless um, colors of like tones and emotions. And, and I think um, these objects and like my um, understanding of like sound and uh, music and that, that layer of like layers of emotions sort of like softens that industrial um, um, aesthetic of the work. Mm. And um, what else was the... I think that was all, we, we were talking about the resonance of it and, and, and as well as that, I think something about because of the fact they're hollow and you leave the, all this negative detail, it creates a lot of lightness to the form and a feeling that what you're actually looking at in steel is a kind of a drawing. Mm. Uh, so sh I apologise for not having images of the work. I'm assuming you've seen it or see it. Um, perhaps we'll close there, Yona, and because somebody might have a question for you, but just first of all, before we close, a huge um, token of appreciation for all that work you've done from all of us at the gallery, but also for the public of Tamaki Makoto in Auckland. Um, it's, the work is going to be up there for seven months, which is also a real privilege to have a sing someone of your capacity think through a single work um, to occupy five spaces is no small feat. Um, so we will have time over the coming weeks and months to enjoy it through program. We have a panel series. We're hoping to get a small sequence of Korean cinema um, up as part of the program, the music, as you've said, and some talks about the work. Do you have any last comment or do you want to take a question if there is one? Um, I just want to thank you to the team and Natasha especially because it's really Natasha's imagination to give me and offer me to imagine bigger. So it was a big challenge and I was like, what were you thinking? You know, <laughs> like, so it's really her imagination that really made this work um, to realize and the team and everyone and the technician um, and the company that work with um, who are metal skills in East Tamaki and true bending in East Tamaki who done all the bending mm. for um, um, for all, all, all the work and um, yeah mm. so thank you and um, yes if you have any questions and I think it's confidence rather than imagination. Confidence in you, <laughs> Yana. <laughs> Does anyone have anything that they would like to hear a little bit more of or something they feel they'd like to add into the conversation or a reflection that you've noticed after looking at the work? It's also... Raise your hand, I can bring a mic. <laughs> I have a quick question, Yana. So um, you talked about uh, the two different entry points into the show. Do you anticipate that the journeys would be quite different or 
did you set it up in a way that it that wasn't really that didn't really matter for visitors? Mm. So I um, so when you when Natasha talked about how the works mirroring the outdoor piece to the glass, and I also thought about when there are two entry points, they mirror each other. So like when you enter, there's a um, uh, a knot and. Um, they are similar but different. So there's a slight variation in terms of where, whether you enter in Friedlander 1 or from Pilaster. So there's something about mirroring um, uh, language in, in the, the whole piece. So um, either or, um, they will be very similar in experience with slight difference. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, question here. Is there a question? Yes. Great. Bring this up. Thanks. Sorry, just a quick one. I was just about earlier on. You said that um, you had these. You've got spaces where you have places where people can rest, or um, and we can see the beds in the <laughs> in the picture here. But I wasn't sure whether to what extent people actually did engage with that or were frightened of doing so, mm. and whether there was any way that you can actually make people feel more relaxed to do it? Because I suspect a lot of people are going to feel very self-conscious if they lie, lie, lie mm, mm, down. Mm. But uh, so is it a bit contrived in that sense or is there a, some way that you can have uh, a piece of work where people really do just feel at home uh, in the way that you, you mm. say? Um, that's a really interesting, interesting question because the, the context of where the works uh, were um, presented, um, it dramatically changed how people um, interact with the work and um, and because it's um, like a museum and we it reveals our um, those restrictions we often have in museums where we're constantly told not to touch and not to um, sort of like to walk too close to a painting. Like, we're so um, accustomed to that behaviour. So I think um, this work um, definitely challenges that uh, um, notions in what we have to, how we behave in, in museums. And, and I think um, if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel, you know, that, I think that sort of process of revealing that, um, that language that we're, used to going to museums. And I think less of like museum context, like when it was in Tetuhi, um, it was more like a community space. Mm. Uh, people, people felt more comfortable to use the bed and use the tables. And I think it's, all, it's more about kind of revealing that hidden mm. or unspoken rules that we're accustomed to visiting this uh, particular spaces. Mm. Mm particularly complex with this work because when something goes outside, it basically has to meet building code standards or you have to get a building waiver. So from all kinds of angles, it's difficult to get consent to build, literally, unless it you know, meets a certain waiver. We managed to negotiate a kind of a grey area in between that an artwork has because it's not a structure that needs to be compliant, but also we need to mitigate uh, the 5% risk that somebody climbs on it and does fall down and break their neck and then, you know, so what we need to be just make really clear is that this is an artwork, <laughs> right? And then if you do something that's against the ethos of the artwork, then you're yourself responsible. But that creates an unusual message as well if what you're really doing is inviting people to sit. So we've had to spend a lot of time in that, in that space that you're talking about. And we did talk about it. We will also have to spend, I think, at least one session with the gallery assistants because it's very different and hard for them, in fact, to go during their day between spaces where they're, like even the Ugo Rondinone, which is actually a very vulnerable work, with no barriers. This is the big clown work in the North Atrium. It's actually quite vulnerable. Jonas is not vulnerable, so they immediately switch to saying it's okay to touch, but having someone even present there can, as you say, make somebody feel self-conscious. So I think it's, people will move through it in relation to their own needs, and I think some of the needs, I mean, maybe the sleeping one is quite 
reserved for a few, but uh, I think a lot of people use the charge station <laughs> and sit down because uh, I don't know if you've been up there yet, but the relationship to the park is really special and it's actually the first time that we've had all the vinyl off and the screens up since we opened. So it's actually rare to, um, through the courtesy of this work, to have that beautiful engagement with Albert Park and the historic trees and just meditate on what that is, that part of the park with its multi-layered history as both a par site for Ngāti Whātua and their iwi neighbours, um, but also used as it was during war and tunnels and battalions and it's an intense cultural site that you're looking at, so, yeah. Yeah, they can. No, no, they can. We can't afford to be... Yeah, you know, we, we can't afford just to be nervous. We have to know ab absolutely what it's capable of dealing with. So we know that it's not capable for five grown men to swing on it. Uh, and it's not really supposed to be used. I mean, Yona doesn't necessarily want people sort of like lumbering all over it, but it's got seats. You can sit on it absolutely comfortably and that's what it's for. And it's got an umbrella for shade and if a small child decided to climb it, it would be strong enough to handle it. But, you know, I'm talking about the neuro social neuroses about public spaces that are embedded in our health and safety laws, so it doesn't have safety mat under it. That's its main non-compliance area. Mm. Mm. Has anyone got any other questions? <laughs> yep. I think I'm rushing up. Do you think that's fair enough? Yeah. Hello there. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this talk. It's really interesting. Um, but I encountered your work in Tatuhi um, previously a few years ago. Um, and I just really love how the work really encounters the space that it's set in and like really um, engages the audience to view parts of the space that they wouldn't have previously appreciated. Um, so I was found it very interesting how you moved from like that tattoo space that's quite open and quite interactive already with the community um, into also this gallery space, which is so, I mean, like it has its own character, but it is very much a museum gallery with the white walls and things. Um, and how you adjusted the work to suit like opening up the space into like more creative opportunity, like possibilities for the audience. Um, and as well as like interacting with the existing kind of audience interaction of like Tatuhi. So I was wondering, is there ever a space that you um, are wanting to go to that you'd like to create a work to suit that space, like an ideal space that you'd like to build your work from in the future? Um, ideal space? Ideal space is or between this idea of the work fitted in a more of a community space or a mm. transitory mm. space mm. and a gallery space. Is, is there, there like an ideal any space for place that you are thinking you'd like to have? Right, right. right. Like any a, other, any yeah. other kind of space? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I mm. like a public. I would space. love. I would love to do it in maybe in like this kind of in you know museums there like spaces with old. 16th century paintings, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, these really traditional, I would love to take over a space like that. That would yeah. be, that, be really fun. Mm. Um, yeah, we, I, I, we've mm. often thought that the McKelvey Gallery mm. would be, I mean, we've often talked about contemporary commissions there because artists do like sort of <laughs> intervening with those spaces. Mm. I know, that's super cool. Thank I think it's a nice question because I agree, it changes the work in different ways and has different 
positives in both spaces. And what I really noticed about the Friedlander galleries, which are much more like, actually the gallery doesn't have that many white cubes per se, but that Friedlander one space is probably the only <laughs> one we have. And what I did notice is it, is it, it, it does define the work much more as sculpture. Mm. That first setting makes you really aware of the geometry, particularly the way they're not butts up against the ceiling and the walls. It creates an awareness for what you're doing, the careful awareness with its depth and those sort of artistic decisions. I think you're, as a viewer, you're, you're made additionally aware of the crafting of the steel, whereas my memory of the previous installations, the City Gallery and the Tatuhi, is you're thinking about sort of in a way the conceptual basis of of what it's doing in the space, creating this kind of housing structure, the kit set housing. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about the different whole uh, <laughs> system you develop to, mm -hmm. to make this work. There's quite a lot there as well, and rethinking it's how it's constructed, but I don't know if, I think we're probably at time, Moira. <laughs> Some people time. need to get out probably and stretch. And yeah, sounds like another um, conversation event though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking about those processes. So um, if anyone doesn't have any last questions, then I think we might wrap up. So thank you so much, Jana and Natasha, for today yeah. and spending mm. your Sunday afternoon with us. Um, it was fascinating hearing about the thoughts, stories and processes behind the work and the In Transit series. So mm. um, thank you. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>